Welcome everybody to Spiritual Metaphysics 101. My name is Yaakov and I'm your host. I'm also a student and teacher of a particular spiritual path called A Course in Miracles. And here's a copy of my book. A Course in Miracles is available in bookstores and online and uh, there is no uh, named author. It's by Anonymous, but it's called A Course in Miracles. And today we're going to be continuing from last uh, episode where we discuss the introduction to A Course in Miracles and I'll give a little synopsis of that and then we went into the material on the acceptance of the atonement which is very foundational in A Course in Miracles as we accept our true nature not as bodies in a world of other separate bodies but as the abstract energy of love metaphysical love experience of love symbolically and reflectively experienced here in the world is forgiveness. So we're going to continue with our discussion of A Course in Miracles from the introduction and with the acceptance of the atonement which is symbolized by forgiveness here in the world. And I want to start with a reading, reading from chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions. And this alludes to the introduction that we discussed last time, nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. Reference to the unreal, nothing unreal exists, which makes forgiveness of the unreal. Things that we perceive, things that we experience, things that seem to frighten us, that is other than love, which is real and can never be threatened. So if it's unreal, then it doesn't exist. And herein lies the peace of God. And we identified one of the obstacles to the experience of love's presence, which is the real and can never be threatened, is the fear of God's will and God's love. Listen to chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions. It says, Your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all of the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. It is not necessary to seek for what is true, but it is necessary to seek for what is false. If you seek love outside yourself, you can be certain that you perceive hatred within and are afraid of it. Yet peace will never come from the illusion of love, but only from its reality. Well, here, this chapter on the forgiveness of illusions is clearly defining that which is the non-physical, within our minds is reality, and that is love. That which we perceive outside of ourselves, the subjective world of thoughts and of ego and of separation and dualism is unreal and is therefore not real. It's not true. And so the peace of God resides in our awareness level coming to the point where we recognize that distinction. Something I see out there has no power to frighten me. When I'm centered in my uh, right mind, when I'm centered in the spiritual mind of love, nothing can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists outside of myself. Herein lies the peace of God. And then it goes on. Across the bridge is your completion, for you will be holy in God, willing for nothing special, but only to be wholly like to him, completing him by your completion. Well, across the bridge refers to this idea of separation from our creator. There's a gap. And when we go back across the bridge, through acceptance of the atonement, through the process of forgiveness, we're crossing back over this tiny gap that really never existed because we can never separate from the love of our Creator. We are an extension of God's love. But the tiny mad idea that we did separate has to be transcended. That's the ego thinking. It has to be crossed back and it says, across this bridge of your ego thinking, of separation and fear and the dualism is your completion. You will be aware of your wholeness as love, as uh, the real that can never be threatened. And you will be holy in God, willing for nothing special, 
which refers to ego matters. You, you're not asking for special uh, favors. You're not asking for individual treatment, uh, possibly at the expense of somebody else that you would have to deprive, but only to be wholly like to him, completing him by your completion. So this is very direct uh, in A Course of Miracles, and I think in so many other spiritual paths back to the love and peace of our Creator. We are whole, W-H-O-L-E. We are holy, H-O-L-Y. We are complete, changeless, timeless. Unlike the body, which is steeped seemingly in, in time and change. And particularly in A Course in Miracles, it emphasizes that we're sinless and guiltless, completely innocent. Because we aren't this body, then anything that we think we've committed or done behaviorally or thought-wise as a separate body in time and space really never happened. And so we can accept the atonement. We, we can accept our salvific idea of innocence and guiltlessness we are truly saved and reborn in the experience of the atonement. So I want to make reference to that. And it says, the bridge that leads to union in yourself must lead to knowledge, for it was built with God beside you and will lead you straight to him where your completion rests, wholly compatible with his. Well, this bridge is this bridge of, uh, you know, forgiveness and love. And it's a collaborative experience between you and your brother, whom you're forgiving, and hopefully the brother accepts the forgiveness. And then you transcend the ego gap between seemingly our identity and that of God, because we're filled with the forgiveness and love that's whole and complete, and it can never be separated, and is always available in a holy instant. Every meeting is a holy encounter. Every meeting is a holy encounter if we're right-minded and make the decision correctly. So we have to keep building on our awareness discipline. Can I make the right-minded decision to forgive a brother? Because what seems to have happened never really occurred. It was a projected thought from my wrong mind, my ego, fearful mind, and so I saw it out there. The Course makes that very clear that projection makes perception. And if I withdraw the projection, then what happens is the perception shifts. And when I'm withdrawing the projection and going from my wrong-minded ego to my right-minded spirit in love, then the projection shifts from fear to love. And that's the miracle in the holy instant. It's very clear. It's very internally precise and consistent, this course. It only teaches to transcend that which we believe happened but could never possibly occurred. And this begins with the idea that we've separated from our Creator. We can start undoing all the thoughts of unworthiness and low self-esteem and that others are unworthy and that they suffer from low self-esteem or are undeserving of a blessing because they are guilty and sinful. We can let go of that because it is nigh impossible. It's impossible. Never happened. And we're waking up from a dream, if you will, where such a dualistic separation occurred. And the Course makes that very clear metaphysically. And when we keep the metaphysics in mind that everything that we perceive is a dream and that our identity is the dreamer, not the figure is in the dream, including the figure we call ourselves, this makes an enormous, uh, powerful shift of, uh, possible because we're no longer the figure in the dream, which seems to be at the effect of all of the world's slings and arrows. We are the dreamer of the dream, and the dreamer can always wake up. The dreamer has the ability to wake up when the dreamer makes the decision to align in the right-minded way with God, God of your understanding, the love that is inherent in the expressive, creative power of God. And once that occurs, it becomes then a forgiveness chain, interlocking chain of forgiveness experiences. And that's what everything is for. 
I want to make a sweeping generalization. Whatever is happening in your life with people, with places, with situations, uh, with your own uh, identity as a body, finances, um, anything that you consider uh, near and dear to you but is seemingly going wrong and you're frightened, this is a lesson in forgiveness according to A Course in Miracles. And when you make the decision to change your mind from ego thinking and fear to right-minded thinking with the Holy Spirit or the Buddha or the Christ or the Tao or the Krishna or Allah, whatever the loving higher power that you identify with is, you then transcend the power. See, it says here, your task is not to seek for love, but to seek and find all the barriers within yourself, all of these seeming problems out in the dream picture, and identify ourselves as the dreamer, and we make a change in our minds so that we embrace God's love rather than be afraid of it. Remember we talked at an earlier episode that the biggest block to the experience or awareness of love is the fear of God's will. Once we've recognized that, then we can say, I'm willing to put aside that fear and offer it up to the Holy Spirit to be um, transformed, if you will, from fear to love. Now how that happens is totally mysterious, and the Course does not explain it because as the Course says, it would, it's really beyond our level of understanding. However, it does make it very clear that even if something's beyond our understanding, our part is very small. All we have to do is make the decision and turn our fears of seemingly appearances in the dream over to the Holy Spirit, who then uh, makes the miracles happen through us and within us and our perception is shifted. So I like that setup. I, I can experience something beyond my ability to understand because all I have to do is exhibit the trust and faith the size of a mustard seed and be willing to turn my projected thoughts and images, projection makes perception, what I'm seeing in the dream, over to the Holy Spirit who then uh, transforms my ego thoughts into holy thoughts, spirit-loving thoughts, and I'm willing to forgive the people, the places, and the things that seemingly have power over me, and they never did. That's why this chapter is entitled, The Forgiveness of Illusions. My wife is always uh, prompted reminding me there's no hierarchy of illusions. Sometimes I'll get engaged in, oh, this is horrific. Well, she's, she's absolutely right, and she's a student of A Course in Miracles as well. What we uh, make into a hierarchical uh, listing of, you know, certain things are super tragic. Other things are, you know, minor annoyances. It's an illusion, it's an illusion, and there's no hierarchy of illusions. We don't remember that, but we can take what we've made so important, made a mountain out of a molehill, and we can offer it up to the Holy Spirit and withdraw our, our projection. And then the miracle happens for us and through us, and as us. And we recognize that a brother and sister, uh, whom we may have had a grievance with, similarly uh, is seen as sinless and guiltless and innocent. And so you're forgiving the sinless person they aren't guilty anymore. I want to share a personal experience with you that I, and over the years, you know, I've, I've talked about my experiences with neighbors because, and, and even in the Bible, it's very clear that it says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So I've had these experiences reoccurring and, you know, anything that reoccurs is an example of a loving lesson in the curriculum that I have yet to master. So it keeps coming up. And this, this happened about a week or so ago with a neighbor. And we got into an argument over some things that uh, I felt were inappropriate on his part as a neighbor. And that he needs to fix this and he needs to change that. And I had all the rules in our condominium complex on my side. I was right. But you know what? 
I forgot the cardinal rule here of love thy neighbor. I was coming from a place of fear. And he will always mirror, anyone in your dream will always mirror your state of mind. So he was similarly clashing with me over fearful thoughts. And we left it at that and I went home and thought about it and practiced, you know, A Course in Miracles, which is my spiritual path. And I had the miracle where I said, okay, I'm experiencing fear and anger and I'm judging this brother. I want to withdraw the projection and I want to offer it up to the Holy Spirit and I want to know the peace of God and I want to be experiencing forgiveness and love towards that man. And when it's a uh, authentic, real decision, which we're totally capable of making, each one of us, to do that, the Holy Spirit takes over quite organically, quite naturally, because that's who we are, one in the love of the Holy Spirit. And I was able to forgive him, and I saw clearly that I had acted inappropriately. Yes, he had too, but he's a figure in my dream. How else could he act if I was dreaming the dream consistent with my ego thoughts, wrong-mindedly? So I later heard that he had talked to somebody else and had made amends concerning some of the things that needed to be changed. And I knew it was a direct, in my dream, this is my dream now, this was an ex a direct example of how the shift in mind you know, the Course says, try not to change, seek not to change the world, but seek to change your mind and your thinking about the world. So I had done that through my willingness to forgive, and next thing I hear, he's willing to make all the concessions and the changes that we felt uh, were necessary and that I had been so fearful and forceful about. It was a wonderful experience. And I I'm just so grateful to be able to experience it and to share it with you because it makes this material come alive. You know, in the abstract and theoretically, it's maybe interesting. But if I can say one thing about A Course in Miracles and any spiritual path, I'm thinking of Buddhism in particular as well, and that is that it alleviates the suffering that we experience. And that's a very pragmatic, practical uh, experience and a payoff, if you will, the fruits of our labor. And these practices, spiritual, metaphysical practices, uh, keeping them in mind and in heart, makes a difference in our everyday normal lives on the physical plane. I was talking to my son uh, earlier this week and he had had some problems with his car and finances and so forth about fixing the car. And I said, as long as you're still, you continue to practice your spiritual journey, those difficulties will begin to lessen and you will feel the alleviation of those difficulties as your mind heals. And he, I think, got it, but you know, he's young and he's at a place in his spiritual journey where maybe it's not as apparent to him as somebody in my situation where I don't have those pressing financial issues anymore. I've got other issues, so they're all the same. But I wanted to uh, at least assure him, based on my experience, strength, and hope, that as your mind heals, the dream and the content of the dream must shift into a happier, more, uh, less suffering, happier, more joyous, freer, filled with love because the dream emanates from the thinking and when we shift our thinking from fear to love the dream shifts accordingly. The waking up finally and transcending the entirety of the dream is a whole other conversation which most of us I, I don't think are ready for. That's for sure with me because I still have seemingly content of the dream that needs to be changed. And I have to keep remembering the content of the dream will change organically and naturally if I change my mind from ego to spirit, from fear to love, because it's all a mirror and a reflection. So his difficulties financially, my difficulties with the issues in relationships and with neighbors and so forth are all continuing lessons in the curriculum in Earth School. 
And the Earth School is presenting us with a reflection of the lessons we've yet to learn. So we need to go back within to the teacher with a capital T, and that's, you know, God of your understanding, who will then set your mind straight, and then the appearances will align with the correct thinking. Change not the world, but change your thinking about the world. And that's what happens. I always like to say parenthetically, this is not about getting rich or, you know, having fame and fortune. If you change your mind about those issues, you're really compounding the error by saying, okay, this isn't a dream. This is real, and I want more riches and abundance and notoriety and celebrityhood because it's so important and I'll feel better. Everything that we've been saying in these uh, episodes really is about only using the appearances in the dream as a motivation to go back within the mind where the real peace uh, exists. A Course of Miracles makes it very clear that it's a course about cause, not the effect that we see in the dream. So there are a lot of New Age uh, types of uh, spirituality that I think are missing the boat when they say if you change your mind you will change your world certainly and this is the be all and end all in terms of the experience we're reversing that and saying look at the experience in the dream and think of it as a lesson to remind you to go back within your mind not to change the world but to change your mind so that you really aren't enmeshed and attached to what happens in the world. And then it can naturally change, but maybe it won't. Then you're not so upset when your finances are in difficulty, or you're not so upset as you might ordinarily be with anything, your mind, your body, uh, your finances, your relationships, when you realize that you are a lucid dreamer and that you're the dreamer of the dream, not a figure in the dream. And that is so difficult, in my experience, to really grasp intellectually. What we need is the trust and the faith in the Holy Spirit, who is within our minds, to make that transition as soon as we make the decision to look towards the Holy Spirit. That transition happens for us, and that's the nature of a miracle. And then I'm at peace. And then the car gets fixed uh, and the money seemingly is available. Or I think more clearly so that I can make the money available to fix the car or make amends to a neighbor or let my wife know that I love her. There's so many opportunities that when we're in panic and we're, when we're in fear, everything appears distorted and it appears overpowering to us. And then we don't have the wherewithal on our own. We aren't the teacher, we're the student. We must at least remember to be willing to go back into the mind and submit to the teacher and ask for the way. Not because the change in the dream is going to make anything better. It's the change in the thinking about the dream from fear to love that will make everything happier. That's the distinction that I want to draw in today's episode. And we only have a few minutes left, but I want to go back to the acceptance of the atonement in chapter 9 of A Course in Miracles. In here, <clears throat> it says, ultimately, everyone must remember the will of God, because ultimately, everyone must recognize himself. This recognition is the recognition that his will and God's are one. This is a very important, powerful, foundational message. The ego says, my will is separate from God's and different. And I want God to change his mind so that he can change things that my will disagrees with. But a true, loving, metaphysical journey recognizes that our will and God's will is one. He's the creator, we're the created. And he knows the path to happiness. We don't. Some of the early workbook lessons in A Course of Miracles, we practice recognizing that we don't know what anything means. And we don't know what would make us happy. So how am I going to insist that God join me in my delusion and make what I think important uh, the source of my happiness when it's been fear-based? I have to change my thinking and surrender, if you will, the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. That's as good as it gets. And then we are 
moving up the ladder of atonement towards the real world where it's filled with love and joy. I want to share another personal experience. I had a uh, revelation several years ago now, but I was overcome, if you will, in a good way by bliss. And it just came over me. And the Course describes that in one of the sections in the early uh, part of the text. Uh, I think it's Miracles, Revelation, and Time, where it says, you know, this is God's way of giving you a little preview of the end of time and what's in store for you to keep motivating you, if you will. Other people have described near-death experiences where they've recognized there's nothing to be afraid of, that we aren't the body, and that there is a soul, and that the soul is based in eternity. And so any way that you and I open up to the possibilities uh, of immortality in love, I think is an acceleration of this process that we're describing, and that's the acceptance of the atonement. Remember then, God's will is already possible and nothing else will ever be. This is the simple acceptance of reality because only that is real. And if you do distort reality, you will experience anxiety and depression because you're trying to make yourself unreal. When you feel these things, do not try to look beyond yourself for truth, for truth can only be within you. It's not outside of you. Simply say, the Holy Spirit is in me, and where He is, God must be, for the Holy Spirit is part of Him, and we are part of the Holy Spirit. Well, I think we've run out of time. We've covered some of the introductory material and the acceptance of the atonement and removal of the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. These are all very important, I think, in the journey that you and I are taking together. And I want to, again, always express uh, my gratitude. You know, there's a, a, an idea or a slogan that uh, an attitude of gratitude is very holy. And if you can make a gratitude list at the end of your day, I think you'll find that quite naturally you'll recognize all of these lessons are coming up to benefit you. Even the things that you may not have you know, sensed were quite to your liking, make that gratitude list and then turn any of the fears and anxiety and judgments that you may have about things and people, turn it over to your higher power within you and then surrender. I've also mentioned the idea of making a God box. You can do that mentally in your mind or you can make a, a little God box with a slit on the top and you put in there what you've written down as things that are troublesome. You'll find that it works because we work and we are one with God as He created us. Shalom, Namaste, and peace. And we'll see you next time. Bye now.